Well, Lorene and I are looking forward very much to the couples event this Friday night, and uh, we want to let you know we have an announcement that has not been any, on any of our promotional material. That is, we have a special guest appearance planned by Jeff Frazier and his wife Erin, um, which is going to be lots of fun, so you don't want to miss it. So invite some friends, invite a couple friend of yours, uh, join us uh, on Friday night. We'd love to see you there. Well, almost exactly a year ago, one of my sons and I took a kind of bucket list trip to Arizona. Uh, we had both seen the Grand Canyon already, but we had a couple other things we really wanted to see. And at the very top of that list was a place called Monument Valley. Uh, you may have uh, seen pictures like this, but it's an area of spectacular rock formations at the very northern edge, the boundary between Arizona and Utah. Anybody been there to see this, uh, Monument Valley? Well, uh, you might recognize this view. This is the road heading into Monument Valley from the north, Highway 163. And by the way, those rock formations in the distance are 12 miles away from the point where you're, 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 what you're looking from, from this perspective. It's an amazing place. Uh, the road, this road was made famous by the movie Forrest Gump because this is where Forrest stopped running in that movie, if you've seen it. So when we were there, we naturally went to this spot to see what it looked like. So we took pictures and all, and then we went back to our hotel. But later after dinner, we decided to go back to the Forrest Gump spot to see what the sky looked like at night. We were lucky to have a very clear night, and my son pointed his camera to the night sky, and he took this photo of the Milky Way. Uh, we decided uh, it was late at night, so we both laid down on our backs in the middle of that road, right on the stripe, and just, just stared at the sky. It, it just it was an overwhelming spectacle of the beauty uh, and, and scope of the universe. And I think um, everyone in this room has had a moment like that where you see Niagara Falls for the first time, or you see the Grand Canyon, or you see the Milky Way, and you have two almost simultaneous sensations. One is you feel very, very small, and at the very same time, you're aware of and in awe of something or someone very, very big. And that's where we begin today. We're in the second week of a series from the book of Psalms called Psalms uh, of songs of the soul. Last week we looked at Psalm 1, which uh, talked to us about the way of blessing and the life of blessing. And today we look at Psalm 8, which we're calling a psalm of wonder. Now you can follow along as I read this text in your little uh, psalm journal, or you can just look at the Bible or watch the screens. Let me read the whole psalm for us, and then we'll go back and see what we learned today. Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1. In fact, I'm going to begin before verse 1, because even though it's, it's uh, not printed in your psalm book, uh, there's a little instruction about music at the beginning of this psalm. And it says, to the choir master, according to the getith, a psalm of David. Now, the word getith here is, is a kind of a mysterious word. Uh, scholars of ancient Hebrew think it refers to a specific kind of stringed instrument, maybe a kind of ancient harp that David discovered in a region called Gath. Um, and we know that David played the harp because we're told that in the Old Testament. So uh, scholars think this was a particular kind of instrument that he just really liked how it sounded. So he's saying, play this one, play this song on the getith, or on the Stradivarius, or on the, the Fender, or whatever kind of instrument uh, you particularly like. Just a small piece of evidence that the Bible is anchored in real time, in real history, with real people. Now the psalm. O Lord, our Lord. Now I want you to notice something here. It's very subtle. But there are two words for Lord there. One is printed in all caps, one is not. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is my man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I want to point out a couple of things as we begin here. Uh, first, we see, obviously, the psalm is bookended by the very same verse. begins and ends with the very same verse, which is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we're going to come back to that at the end. But between those two verses, 
there's this question right at the center of the psalm, which is, what is man that you are mindful of him? And this psalm or ancient song is constructed intentionally around those three things, the two verses that bookended it and that question right at the middle. Three main truths we're going to look at in this psalm. First, the wonder of God, then the wonder of humanity, and finally the wonder of worship. First, the wonder of God. When one of our sons was very young, he developed a fascination with whales. You know, as little kids will, will kind of latch on to something. Well, whales became his thing. I think it started with the, the movie uh, Free Willy. Anybody remember Free Willy? Well, he started to love whales. Um, and his favorite were killer whales. <clears throat> and uh, by the time he was four or five years old, he could name not only a killer whale and recognize them, but all kinds of other whales. We had this little bin. In fact, we still have it. It's much bigger than this. But he could tell you about sperm whales. He could tell you about belugas. He could tell, tell you about... I think that's a gray whale. He could tell you about all these, but his favorite were killer whales. And he would play with them in the bathtub and so forth. Uh, he just loved them. So one year we decided to take a family trip to Ohio where my brother lived near Cleveland. And in Cleveland in those days, there was a, a SeaWorld. And SeaWorld had this feature killer whale called Shamu. So we thought we'll take our son to see Shamu. So we got to the park and I, we went straight to the, uh, the, the, the pool where they would keep Shamu between shows so you could walk up and see him up close. So I picked my son up, who was about five years old at the time, so he could see over the edge into the, into the pool. And the, the whale was right there, and his eyes got wide. And he said in this hushed, sort of awestruck tone, he said, he's really big. <laughs> I thought to myself, of course he's going to say that. He, all he knew was a little model of a whale. And to see the real one, he was overwhelmed. And I think we're all a little bit like my little son. And that is, no one gazes up at the Milky Way or takes a look at the Grand Canyon and reacts by saying, wow, I'm awesome. <laughs> we don't do that. David begins, oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now there's something we can miss here. I mentioned those two uh, words, Lord. Uh, the one printed in all caps represents the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. It's the ancient name of God, a personal name that God gave to Moses way back in the book of Genesis so that he could know who he was talking to. And the word means, I am that I am. The second Lord is printed uh, just with one capital letter, L, and that's referring to the title, a different Hebrew word, Adonai, which is a title meaning Lord or Master. So in a sense, David is beginning the psalm saying, Oh, Yahweh. The one who is self-existent forever. The one who gives us your personal name so we can know who you are. Oh, Yahweh, you are our Adonai, our master. It's significant. How majestic is your name in all the earth, he says. The word translated majestic here just means excellent or magnificent. And then he says that majesty is expressed in three ways. First, through glory. It says you have set your glory above the heavens. Now, glory is splendor, that which is awesome. Glory is what we sense, what we feel when we look up at the Milky Way. And God's glory, the Bible said, is seen through creation. Paul in the book of Romans in the New Testament writes this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. We'll talk more about creation in just a few minutes. Secondly, majesty is expressed in strength. It's a word that just means power or might. Verse 2, he says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and avenge you. Now, if you're paying any attention at all, something in you should go, whoa, whoa, time out, time out. This makes no sense. If enemies are attacking and avengers are coming to try to destroy, and ancient Israel had plenty of enemies, you don't say, let's send the babies out to fight. Where are the babies? Where are the toddlers? Just get them out there makes no sense. How and why would God establish his strength through babies and infants? Now here David might be referring to God's fondness for using the seemingly weak to defeat the strong. Like in his own life, the young shepherd boy David defeated the great enemy Goliath. Or more likely, this is a reference to the coming, the promised coming of the Messiah. 
The prophet Isaiah said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Matthew chapter 21 in the New Testament, Jesus is being criticized by religious leaders for allowing children to call him Hosanna or Messiah. And Jesus quotes to them this verse from Psalm 8. He says, Have you not read from the mouth of lips, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise? Thirdly, majesty is expressed in works, David said. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. I want to focus on that little phrase, the work of your fingers. Work is a word that means accomplishment or that which has been made. Now, fingers here is a little bit unique. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we often see the phrase, the hand of God. And the hand of God tends to refer to the sovereignty of God. Like he'll say, I have you in my hand, his sovereign care. We also see the phrase, the arm of God quite often. And the arm of God tends to refer to God's power to deliver and rescue his people. But here he says, the work of your fingers. Referring to the work of a craftsman, of an artist. So here's what David is saying. When I look at the heavens, what we would call the universe, and by the way, what we know now about the universe is vastly greater than what David knew about the universe. As a shepherd boy looking up at the night sky. It's greater than David could have ever imagined. I consider uh, this comparison. If our solar system, you know, from the sun, past the earth, all the way out to the planet Neptune, if we made our whole solar system the size of a quarter, okay, the galaxy we are in, the Milky Way, that picture I showed you before, the galaxy which our solar system is in would be the size of the continental United States. Okay, so imagine that difference, a quarter to the continent of the United States, and we now believe there are upwards of 350 billion galaxies in the known universe. And David says, all of this is the work of God's finger, so how big is God in David's mind? Or maybe you want to go the other way, let's go small. Your brain has 10 billion nerve cells all working together. Your eyes have 100 million cells in each, receptor cells in each retina, in each one. Your skin has more than 2 million tiny sweat glands, about 3,000 per square inch to help regulate your temperature. And today they're not happy, right? (laughs) Tiny details, tiny details fashioned by the finger of God. And then comes this obvious question, the heart of the psalm. Verse 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? That's the Hebrew word Adam, which means man or humankind. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And that leads us to the second point we see in the psalm, the wonder of humanity. The wonder of humanity. How many of you... um, sports fans, maybe you old-timer sports fans, remember a name, David Thompson. Anybody remember David Thompson's name? Some of you might remember. Well, David Thompson, to put it uh, in a short fashion, was kind of Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan in the basketball world. He was the guy Michael Jordan wanted to be like when he grew up. Back in the 70s, he was a three-time All-American for North Carolina State, went on to a, a Hall of Fame career in the NBA. When I was a senior in high school in 1974, Um, David Thompson came to visit our school because his college roommate had gone to my high school. So he came up for a couple days, and I actually got to play pickup basketball after school with the greatest college player in the country at that time. You can imagine what a thrill that was for me as a basketball guy, just playing pickup ball with this guy who went on to be a multi-million dollar NBA player. Well, fast forward two years from then. Uh, By this time, I'm in college uh, near near Charlotte, North Carolina, and I had a chance to go see David Thompson play Uh, during his first or second year in professional basketball. Um, And some buddies and I went to this game, and as the teams were warming up, he's on the side of the court, and he's just surrounded by like 100 kids trying to get his autograph because he was the local hero. And so whatever got into me, I said to my buddies, hey, watch this, and I walked down to the floor. Now, what I was thinking was maybe I can get close enough to him to remind him that a couple years ago, you know, I met him, and then maybe he might act like he knew me, and I could show off to my friends. 
So I went down to the edge of this crowd. There's 100 kids around him. He's standing in the middle of it. He looked up and he saw me and he broke into this big grin. I'm not, I'm not making this up. He broke into a big grin and said, Hi, Brian, good to see you again. He remembered my name. He walked through that whole crowd like the Red Sea parted and he shook my hand. And we chatted together for like 30 seconds. And then I walked back to my friends and they were going, you know David Thompson? And I was like, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Inside I'm thinking, who am I? Who am I that he would remember my name? David begins with how majestic is your name, your glory, your strength, the works of your fingers. And then he moves to a question. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. David is saying with all that God is and all that God has made, how can it be that he remembers, that he thinks about, that he pays attention to human beings? How is it? The psalm is saying that God is mindful of human beings because the very purpose of his creative work, the focus of his attention is us, is humanity. Now, most of you uh, have probably heard of a scientific project called SETI, S-E-T-I, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. For 35 years or so, maybe more, the SETI Institute has been systematically scanning the universe for signs of intelligent life. There are spin-off cousins like something called SERENDIP, S-E-R-E-N-D-I-P, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Radio Emissions from Nearby Developed Intelligent Populations. Or, as I like to think about it, Green Bay fans who live in Wisconsin, but <laughs> neither here nor there. There's a current effort called Breakthrough Listen, which is a $100 million project uh, using even larger and more powerful radio telescopes to scan the heavens. Now, these massive projects are all based on an assumption. The assumption that with billions of galaxies in the universe, there have to be hundreds of potential planets that could inhabit that could uh, support intelligent life. That's the, the assumption. And so if we try hard enough to find them, if we listen hard enough, we'll find them or they'll find us. A recent poll actually showed that 60% of Americans believe that life exists on other planets. 60% of us. I mean, after all, we've watched Star Trek. <laughs> Some of you younger people have watched, you know, the whole Star Wars thing. I mean, how many movies are there? 47? Or maybe going back to the godfather of all space travel, Lost in Space. You remember Lost in Space? <laughs> but you know what SETI has found in 35 years? Nada. Zilch. Nothing. <coughs> Overwhelming silence from the entire universe. Now, maybe they will find something. I don't know. But you know what? Most, many, many scientists are beginning to think something different. They're beginning to think that maybe life does not occur easily. Maybe life does not develop easily. Maybe it's a miracle of sorts that there's life even on this one planet, never mind the rest of the universe. In fact, the late astrophysicist Stephen Hawking once um, calculated the mathematical possibility of life, intelligent life, happening on Earth, and he came up with zero. Meaning, apart from God and the work of his fingers, we shouldn't even be here. Verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. The psalm here says four specific things about human beings. First, God cares for us. The Hebrew word translated cares for can also be translated as visits. That is, who are we that he should visit us? Perhaps pointing to the coming of Christ into the world as the God who is with us. Second, God made human beings a little lower than the heavenly beings, David said. The word translated heavenly beings here is actually the Hebrew word Elohim, most often translated as God or gods. This ancient, ancient psalm actually confronts, I think, and corrects two very common modern misconceptions. The first misconception is that there's nothing particularly special about human beings. That human beings are just the same as animals or plants. That we are all just accidents of the universe. Famous British philosopher Bertrand Russell, who described himself as part agnostic and part atheist, 
famously wrote, quote, man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. In other words, you are an accident. Your entire life, all your hopes and dreams are accidental and have no meaning in the universe. I want to say something here, especially to the younger people among us, people, students, middle school, high school, college students. The Bible, God's word, says you are not an accident. You're not an accident of the collision of atoms randomly coming together by processes that you don't understand. You are not the product of random collisions. You are intentionally created, intentionally designed by a God of infinite glory to be a little lower than himself. The other misconception is that human beings are God. Let me explain. This is what our culture today teaches. Truth is in you. Find your own truth. Speak your truth. Live your truth. You get to make your own truth. Again, to you younger people, there is no truth inside you to find. There is not. It's one of the oldest lies in the Bible. Way back in the book of Genesis, the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the garden with a question and a lie. The question was, did God really say? And the lie is, you can be like God. The psalm says we are neither. Truth is not inside us. Truth comes from outside us, from the God of all truth. We are not God, but we are not like the rest of creation either. Thirdly, we see, he says, you have crowned him with glory and honor. This is also a reference back to Genesis. Of all the created order, we are told only human beings are created in the image of of God. Now, what is the, why does the image of God matter? It matters because if every human being is created in the image of God, it means, among other things, that we are created for eternity. We have an eternal soul, which means every single human being is of infinite value to the God who created him or her. And if that's true, then things like racism or sexism or child slavery or human trafficking or abortion are not only wrong, but do violence to the very image of God. That's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, because he or she is created in the image of God. Finally, fourthly, David says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. Dominion means to rule over to have authority over. This also reaches back to Genesis. God entrusted Adam and Eve with the responsibility to tend and care for the garden. Dominion is understood as the balance between using the resources of the earth for food and shelter and caring for the earth as stewards. If you have a pet at home, if you have a dog, you understand what dominion means. You have authority over the pet, You teach it, you train it, and so forth. You also care for it. You don't abuse it. Again, this corrects two mistakes we see in our common world, common culture, modern culture. First, that we can just use and abuse the earth, or the environment. And on the other hand, that we should elevate the earth to to a place of worship. That's the most important thing. It's neither. If you leave out responsibility, the result is wanton consumption of the earth's resources and destruction of the earth's beauty. But if you leave out rulership, then you get the view that humankind is on the same level in value as, for example, a spotted tree frog, which is just not true, not according to the Bible. The Bible teaches that God has delegated the earth to human beings to have dominion over it. We are free to use its resources for our needs, but must also do so as responsible stewards. Of the earth. That leads us to the third thing, the wonder of worship. The wonder of worship. The psalm begins and ends with the same verse, kind of like a chorus to a song. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And between those two refrains is the question, what is man 
that you are mindful of him? Who is the son of man that you should care for him? For here's the central point of this psalm. We cannot understand the significance of human life without recognizing the glory of God. Which means you cannot begin to understand the significance and meaning of your own life unless you recognize the glory and majesty of the God who created you. So this psalm is really celebrating the relationship between the created and the creator. And that relationship I would call worship. What is worship? Here at Chapel Street, we like to define it as the offering of extravagant devotion to someone or something. And by that definition, human beings are capable of worshiping almost anything. We can give our extravagant devotion to almost anything. But we all worship something. David would define worship as recognizing the majesty of God and responding with wonder, awe, surrender, and obedience. So what does the majesty of God have to do with who I am and how I live? First of all, it means I'm not God. And sadly, neither are you. But you're not a tree or an animal either. You're not an accident. God is mindful of you, David says. It means he knows you. He cares for you. He's come to visit you. You see, this God tells me who I am. This God tells you who you are and why you're here. And so we worship and serve him. We worship and serve him, not the other way around. Here's the truth. Everything in our lives is shaped by who or what we worship. Everything in our lives is shaped by who or what We worship the way we see and understand the world. The entire universe is shaped by the one we worship. How we understand ourselves, our value, our purpose, our identity is shaped by the one we worship. How we see other people, how we treat other people created in his image is shaped by the one we worship. And that's why, some 3,000 years ago, a man named David looked up at the heavens and said, Our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's bow in prayer as I close. Lord, we thank you today for your word, for this ancient song that speaks both to who you are, and to the very center of who we are. And so may we kneel in awe before your majesty and your glory. May we be overwhelmed that you are mindful of us, that you care. And may we respond with wonder and worship and trust.